So, Senator, you've been in the Senate um, since 2008. Um, nine. Nine. Yeah. Well, yes, you were elected, elected in 2008. In <laughs> um, what's an issue that you'd say you've changed your mind on during that time or a vote that you wish you could have back? Hmm. Um, you know, one of the one of the things that I think it's fair to say that I've changed my mind on is around nuclear power. And I have um, been become more and more concerned about climate change and the potential for climate change to well, it's an existential threat, I think, not just to the United States, but to the planet. And as I have studied, I spent my first four years, I was on the Energy Committee in the Senate. And one of the conclusions that I came to is that if we, if we were really going to be able to address climate change, that we can't totally eliminate nuclear power, um, at least not in the short term, that we've got to look at other sources of energy, but if we're gonna eliminate, if we're gonna phase out fossil fuels, which I think we need to do, then we've got to continue to have nuclear power um, for some period of time. So I, I think that's probably one of, one of the, the biggest changes as I have thought about how we address climate change. Can I ask a clarifying question? Sure. Um, when you say that you have changed your mind on that before you, you were opposed to nuclear power, are you saying? Well, I was concerned about the potential impacts of nuclear power. And um, from the days when we were starting to build Seabrook in New Hampshire, had raised concerns about whether the dangers were worth the, whether the potential costs and dangers were worth it. Um, but as I have looked at the other challenges that we're facing now and what has happened to climate change and the growing scientific data about that, I think it's really, um, it's hard for me to see how we make progress on that and totally get rid of nuclear power. Would you say um, that there are still some issues to be resolved with moving ahead with more nuclear power? I mean, one thing that- Oh, sure. I think there are lots of um, issues that we need to continue to address, but the idea that we would just close all of our nuclear power plants in the country, which some had promoted for, um, for much of, I would say, probably the 80s and 90s and the early 2000s, um, I think is looking less and less like the solution that people were thinking it might be. What do you think we would um, do with all the waste? Well, that's clearly one of the challenges that we still have to address. And we don't have um, an answer to that yet and have really not made any progress on this issue since I was governor. And we were talking about putting the waste in Yucca Mountain, which is still on the books, but it's not likely to ever happen. Um, there are some other, I think France has been more effective than we have in looking at what to do with our nuclear waste. And that's clearly something that we've got to continue to figure out how we're going to address. Okay. Um, so uh, kind of in a different direction, um, when we talked about you, uh, talked with you last time, uh, six years ago, one of the things we talked about uh, was the growing pressure on the middle class. And that seems to have only increased in the time since. Uh, what have you done in the Senate in the past six years that's, that's helped on that front? Well, I've certainly supported efforts to address student loans. Now, because we're in the minority, it's been hard to get some of these things done. Um, I opposed the tax bill that the Trump administration introduced that went over, um, was passed and was written in behind closed doors, never had a public hearing and was passed with very little debate, which has exacerbated the challenges that middle income Americans are facing. Uh, I continue to support efforts to improve access to housing 
improve um, health care, which has been was the biggest cause of bankruptcies before the Affordable Care Act for middle income Americans. And I am very concerned that when the Supreme Court takes up the Affordable Care Act post election, that they are going to overturn it in its entirety and return chaos to our health care system. Um, instead of doing that, we need to be improving on the Affordable Care Act and how it works and addressing some of the challenges that it's had, not trying to overturn it because there is no alternative plan. Um, I've also supported efforts to increase um, support for food for Americans. We just passed a continuing resolution to keep the government open until December 11th, and we included $8 billion that's mostly going to food programs. Um, $3.5 billion is going to go to programs for kids um, to feed, um, and for the WIC program, significant funding to support the EBT, the program that helps um, feed kids in school and feeds kids who um, younger than school and families that need food security. Um, you know, so I've been, I've been trying to think about all of the ways in which we can support middle income Americans. And one of my concerns about the CARES Act was in trying to ensure that um, we could help keep people afloat as they were facing this pandemic. And my support for small businesses has to do with helping middle income Americans. As you know, small businesses are the backbone of New Hampshire's economy. And I was pleased to be one of four people who helped write the Paycheck Protection Program, which had some challenges as it was initially rolled out, but I think it's helped over 24,000 small businesses in New Hampshire and brought in two and a half billion dollars to the state to help them stay afloat. It's one of the reasons why I'm still so focused on trying to get an additional package of assistance for those people who really need help. We still have too many people who are unemployed. We have a number of small businesses who, a number that have been very successful who are getting back to where they were, but we've still got a number that are very concerned about how they're gonna get through the winter and they need additional help. We've got cities and towns, counties, that have been on the front lines of the pandemic that really need continued assistance. You know, I was pleased that we held out on the CARES package back in March so that we got an additional 1.25 billion for the state of New Hampshire. And I think the, the commission that has helped distribute those funds, they have helped to make a difference for a number of people. And that's one of the, one of the sticking points in trying to get another package of assistance that the proposal that Mitch McConnell has introduced to the Senate doesn't include funding for um, states and communities. It doesn't include additional funding for hospitals. I was at St. Joseph's Hospital in Nashua last week and they talked about the financial hit they've taken, the number of employees they've had to furlough because of the suspension of voluntary procedures and the concerns people have because of the pandemic about coming back to the hospital. So um, again, I think there's lots of work that we still have to do to try and help people get through this. And most of those people who are being helped are people who are in that middle income range who are hit the hardest by what's been happening in the economy. Um, you know, Supreme, Supreme Court nominations have been in the news over the last couple of weeks. Um, if if um, the Democrats should gain the, the seats required to take action on this matter, is there any structural changes to the Supreme Court that you would support? I don't support a legislation that would pack the court um, as Theodore, as President Roosevelt tried to do back when he was president and the Supreme Court was not making decisions that he liked. I don't think that's the best way to deal with this situation. Getting back to, to uh, some of the, the uh, work on coronavirus, um, we, we surveyed some of our community members to find out what they were interested in hearing from uh, 
in terms of issues uh, and the candidates. And so um, they were interested to, to find out more about what should be done to both stem the tide of the virus and to get the economy back on track, which you kind of alluded to before. Well, first of all, I don't think we're going to get the economy back on track. We're not going to get back to normal until we have control of this coronavirus. And everything that I've heard from the medical experts in Washington, from listening to people who are reporting, is that the most important thing to, we can do is be um, is have consistent messaging around what people need to do in response to the virus. And one of the real challenges early on that has continued to be a challenge, and I still hear from um, people who, as I go around New Hampshire, who say, you know, we never got any consistent information about what we should do in response to the virus. I heard that in Summersworth last Friday when I was talking to um, officials, town officials there, or city officials there who were concerned about um, the schools and what was happening in the schools. And we have had very mixed messaging. I was in the hearing a week, couple of weeks ago with Dr. Redfield, the head of the CDC, when he talked about the importance of masks um, in stemming this virus and protecting yourselves. And again, focusing on mask wearing, on social distancing, on um, hygiene, um, and making sure that places are clean, that your hands are clean, not shaking hands, not hugging, not kissing, the kinds of things that we would normally do with our friends and um, colleagues. And that is number one. We need a consistent message when we're talking about public health. There has not been one from day one. Um, the second thing we need to do is have more testing and contact tracing. Um, Everything that I know about this virus is that um, the best way to identify people who are contagious is to have regular testing. I was at UNH several weeks ago and wa they walked me around their new lab there. They're doing 25,000 tests a week of students at UNH. And I don't, I'm not sure what Keene is doing um, but one of the things that UNH said is that they have the capacity with some additional resources to be able to um, test everyone in the university system. So they could also do Keene and Plymouth if those colleges decided that that was something they wanted to do and they could partner on it. Um, but what the testing has allowed them to do with a few hiccups early on, because um, there were some parties that were um, students were not um, staying far enough apart, they were not doing what they should have, and so there was an outbreak. But since then, since they've got the testing program up and running, uh, they've been able to control who has tested positive, isolate those people, figure out who they came in contact with, which is the contact tracing piece, which is also so important. And then you can um, isolate those folks, you can let everyone else go about their normal business, and that's how we can keep control of the virus until we can get a vaccine, until we can get the kind of therapeutics that we need. You know, we also should have, um, I have called on the president from back in March to put in place full steam, the Defense Production Act, so we could produce what we need in terms of PPE equipment, in terms of the cleaning supplies, all of the things that are so important to address this virus so that we could do them here in the United States. You know, we were fortunate in New Hampshire that we had Dean Kamen and we were able to work with Dean, worked with us at the federal level, worked with uh, the governor to bring in PPE equipment when we couldn't get it anywhere else. But there are a lot of states that haven't been able to do that and there are still, uh, we are still hearing from medical providers, from other, from schools, that they can't get the PPE that they need, um, and that the cost of doing that is very challenging for many of those school districts. So we should be doing, we should have ramped that up from day one and be really have been focused on that. 
So those are some of the things that I think we've got to do in order to get ahead of this virus. And sadly, on many of those things, we're still not doing them as well as we should be doing them. Witness the president's um, response to being tested positive for the coronavirus and the fact that, you know, last night, well, he left the hospital, first of all, um, when it was not clear that he was actually, um, that the doctors had recommended that, and second, that he went back to the White House, that he didn't wear a mask, that um, he has tweeted out about how this virus is not so bad and we've just got to get ahead of it. Well, when you've lost over 210,000 people to the coronavirus, it is serious. We need to take it seriously and we all need to accept responsibility for trying to respond to it. You mentioned the PPP and also the CARES Act. Is there other legislation that you would put forth to help people who've lost their jobs and small businesses that have been hit so hard? Well, I focused a lot of my attention on the PPE as the way to address small businesses. Um, we have a, a round four of the Paycheck Protection Program that has been introduced that I'm still hoping we can get on another um, COVID package that I'm still hopeful we can get done in the Senate. It would better target some of those dollars to the smallest businesses, the mom and pop shops that in some cases weren't able to get help because they didn't have a, a relationship with a bank. So I think we need to continue to look at that. There are a lot of other things that I've been working on um, consistently that I think help small businesses. I think the helping them get into international markets, the STEP program is um, something that I helped get passed back in 2010 when we did the Small Business Jobs Act, and that still is paying dividends for small businesses. Um, I think one of the challenges that we're having in New Hampshire right now is the border being closed with Canada. And we have lots of folks in the northern part of the state and lots of commerce that depends on that cross-border um, activity. And so I've recently called on um, the administration to open those borders so that we can continue getting that activity. Um, so those are some of some of the things that I've been working on. And what do you think should be done to prepare for future pandemics? Well, first of all, we need to, I think we need to look at our public health system across this country. One of the one of the reasons, as I understand, that South Korea has been so successful in limiting the number of cases and deaths there is because they've had a public health system that um, they could say to people, you can, go, you can go get your test, it will be paid for, and that was instant. Um, here, first of all, we had to get the testing set up, then we had to decide that we were going to allow well, at least this, is, this was the approach that the um, administration and CDCs took, then it took some time before they were willing to let the private labs do testing and diagnostics. It took some time before they were willing to let um, medical hospitals like Dartmouth-Hitchcock do some of that testing. And so we need to look at our public health system and make sure that it is more effective. I had a, a good conversation with Dr. Redfield actually some time ago about his interest in um, revamping the public health system in the U.S. and the CDCs to better, the CDC to better coordinate with public health. Um, so I think we need to restore the national security team that was um, dismantled after President Trump came into office that looked at pandemic and disease and the potential for that to affect our national security. And so that we have intelligence that can give us a, a better head start when we think there's something happening around the world. I think we were able to do a better job with um, H1N1 because we had some of that early intelligence that told us we need to start getting prepared. 
So those are a couple of things I think we need to do. So Senator, one of the primary jobs in Congress for the coming year or years will be to uh, address uh, mounting national debt, uh, which has been made deeper by the pandemic response. Um, and we talked with your opponent, um, his priority in doing that would be to reduce spending. What, uh, what would your approach be? Well, first of all, let me just say, as governor, I balanced three budgets. Um, I made some tough cuts when we had to make them. As a senator, I was very engaged when President Obama appointed the Simpson-Bowles Commission and they made a number of recommendations for addressing the debt and deficit. And I supported many of those recommendations. I voted to, to um, further continue the actions of the Simpson-Bowles Committee and to consider adopting their recommendations or at least to put a, a group together in the Senate to, and the House to try and do that. Sadly, nothing came of that activity and so I think right now, as I have listened to economists talk about the current situation that we're in, um, everyone I've heard from has suggested that the most important thing we can do right now is to continue to invest in the economy in ways that will help commerce come back, that will help keep small businesses afloat that will help keep consumers afloat so they can continue to pay their bills, pay their rent, buy food. Um, and that, that infusion of dollars through the CARES Act into the economy has been one of the reasons that we have been able to come back, not as far as we need to, clearly, but in the way that we have. So I think, you know, if we look at what happened in the Great Depression, the the effort to contract the economy when the Great Depression hit made the depression worse. It's just like when we saw the financial meltdown in 2008. Instead of stopping spending, as many people um, wanted the Obama administration to do, we made investments through the Recovery Act that were significant in helping to get people back to work and helping to um, stimulate the economy in ways that we need to. And we need to do that, I believe, now. Now, at some point down the road, are we gonna need to address the debt and deficits? Absolutely, but now is not the time to do that. Uh, everyone's attention right now is, of course, focused on the COVID pandemic, but here in New Hampshire, we're struggling with another issue, which is the opioid crisis. Um, you know, what are, what, you know, if reelected, what are some steps that you, you might take or advocate for to, to fight against that? Well, first of all, I would go back to 2016 when we were able to put together a package that increased funding for the opioid epidemic significantly. We passed legislation that put a billion dollars into um, our addressing our opioid epidemic. And we built on that in 2017 and 2018. And we went in New Hampshire from receiving about $3.7 million in state opioid response grants to last year, I think we received over 30 million, about 34 million in those opioid response grants. They went down a little bit this year, but um, we basically increased the funding for that significantly. And that's why the state of New Hampshire was able to start the doorway program. Um, I, I've heard the governor's ads about the doorway program and this morning and I think that's been a great response but we were able to do that because at the federal level we got the dollars and we brought them back to New Hampshire and one of the things that I worked with the Trump administration to do is to increase the set aside um, which is what has allowed us to to get that much money in the SOR grants because um, we were able to say for the 10 states that are hardest hit, we need some additional dollars because it's having a much greater impact in states like New Hampshire, um, where the numbers may not be as high as the numbers of overdose 
overdoses in a state like Illinois or New York or California, but on a percentage basis, we are very hard hit. I think we're now down to about fourth, but um, the, the reduction that we were beginning to see in overdose deaths through 2019 has begin to, begun to go back up. And so we really have to continue to remind people about how important it is to invest in um, ways that will help address this epidemic. Um, I supported an expansion of medication-assisted treatment, which has been very important in helping people get um, treatment so that they can stay clean, um, changing the number of patients who could be seen by each doctor. Um, been very worked on trying to address fentanyl coming into the United States from China and across the border and have worked on bipartisan legislation that would um, support better detection at our southern border for fentanyl and um, better examination of the mail and um, fentanyl coming in through China and trying to address it at its source in China. So we need to continue to do that. You know, it's a two-pronged approach. We need to look at how we can help prevention, three-pronged really, prevention and treatment, and then of course law enforcement to address those people who are um, pushing and bringing drugs into the state. One of the things that has probably made as big a difference as anything else has been the expansion of Medicaid in New Hampshire as part of the Affordable Care Act, so that people who um, were not able to get treatment before from opioids are now able to access that treatment through the expansion of Medicaid. And I applaud um, Governor Hassan and the Republican legislature for coming to an agreement and for them being able to continue that program last year as well. Um, you know, these services are one part of a much bigger discussion on healthcare. And, you know, obviously you talked about this a little bit before, but there are a few different potential um, futures for America's healthcare system at this time. Um, we can address it from either way, either what happens if Obamacare is overturned or, you know, addressing any shortcomings that exist now. But what do you think are the next steps for the U.S. in terms of enhancing both access to healthcare and, and making it more affordable? Well, first of all, we've got to defeat the um, the effort to overturn the Affordable Care Act. So uh, it's one of the concerns that I have about the effort to put Amy Coney Barrett on the Supreme Court right now is that she has uh, a known record of saying she opposes the Affordable Care Act. And the problem is there is no alternative. So Donald Trump keeps saying, oh, I've got this great plan. The Republican Congress members of Congress and the Senate and the House keep saying, oh, we've got a plan. We've got an alternative plan. We're gonna cover pre-existing conditions. That's all baloney. There is no plan. If we, they had had a plan, we'd have seen it. You know, we passed the Affordable Care Act in 2009. It got implemented in 2014 with some challenges, but we've seen it actually work. In New Hampshire, we've got between 90 and 100,000 people who have now got health care coverage either through the expansion of Medicaid or through the Affordable Care Act. That number's gone down a little bit in the last couple of years because of the effort by the Trump administration to um, stop, to reduce to almost zero the outreach to help people enroll in the Affordable Care Act, to provide uh, support for navigators, people who could help those who needed help with enrolling. Um, but it's still making a huge difference. If the Affordable Care Act gets overturned, we are going to see 21 million people in this country lose their health insurance. And there is no backup plan. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to go back to the system that we had before then, when if you had a pre-existing condition, um, you often couldn't get health insurance. And if you could, it was more expensive and there were caps on the amount of money that they would spend to cover whatever your illness was, where there was less focus on prevention. One of the best things about the Affordable Care Act has been the essential health benefits. Those, um, the coverage for those benefits that are important to, to people, whether it's preventive screenings or um, helping ensure that things like physical therapy and mental health are also covered. Um, that's really important. Now, do we have work to do if we can keep the Affordable Care Act? Absolutely. 
Um, we need to look at ways we can expand coverage under the Affordable Care Act. I think one way to do that is a public option. It is to allow people to buy into either Medicare or Medicaid at a younger age, or if they have um, trouble, if they're in a state, for example, that didn't expand Medicaid and yet they need health insurance coverage to be able to expand in that way. And there's legislation to do all of those things. And I think that is probably the fastest way to expand coverage under the Affordable Care Act. But we've also got to look at some of the other things that I think were really important about it. Um, one of the best aspects of the law, I think, was the innovation fund, the effort to look at what works in healthcare in a way that is both more effective, but also can bring down costs of healthcare. So delivery system reform, something that Dartmouth Hitchcock has worked on, I think is, is a really important aspect of care. One of the biggest drivers in healthcare is the cost of prescription drugs. We know what we can do to lower the cost of prescription drugs, and we're not doing any of them um, because the pharmaceutical companies have set the agenda. If we allowed CMS to negotiate for Medicare in the way that the VA negotiates with the pharmaceutical companies, we would be able to lower the cost of prescription drugs. We know that we can increase the ability and the time frame in which generics can come to market and that that helps lower costs. We know that we can allow safe reimportation of drugs from Canada and from other countries. That lowers costs. And I have legislation that would keep pharmaceutical companies from being able to get a tax write-off for all of their advertising because we know that that's baked into the cost of the drugs. So why should they get it to double dip and have the taxpayers also pay for those costs? So there are a number of things that we can do. And right now we're not doing any of those things. I could go on, but we have limited time. Yes. Yeah. Um, this, this is a, a question that, that comes from a reader. Um, in, in what ways do you hope to better racial equality and racial justice, both here in New Hampshire and nationwide? I think some of you may know this, but I grew up in Southeast Missouri. I went to segregated schools as a kid. I taught in Mississippi in 1970 when they fully integrated the schools in that state. And I have seen firsthand the impact of racial inequality, both in communities where I've lived, in the work that I've done, and in reports and the data. And we need to address it. And what we had this summer after the murder of George Floyd was an opportunity to really begin a national dialogue about this issue that clearly the voters want. You know, people have been demonstrating, they're still demonstrating in certain places. And to address not just the concerns about law enforcement that we saw with George Floyd, but the other challenges. You know, when I, Senator Hassan and I had a, in the middle of, shortly after, George Floyd's death, we had um, a conversation with a number of African American leaders in New Hampshire. And one of the things they talked about, and it was not just older people uh, like Jerry and Bogus, but it was some of the younger folks who have been part of the Black Lives Matter movement. And they talked not just about law enforcement, they talked about healthcare, um, pointed out what we know is the, um, the devastating toll that the coronavirus has taken on the African-American community um, and the Latino community, by the way. They talked about um, the awareness that people are not aware of and they, they don't think about the inequities that exist. Um, they talked about the importance of education in that and helping people to, to see some of the differences and learn to talk about them and to engage. And we blew that moment at, in Congress, at least in the Senate. Um, I think we had an opportunity to, to make a statement and to work together to get that done. You know, um, obviously the Republicans had a piece of legislation, the Democrats um, had a piece of legislation. And when Tim Scott's bill was defeated, 
Mitch McConnell didn't try and bring people together, didn't try to bring in various parties to say, let's see if we can't work out something that can begin to address some of our differences. He just said, okay, the Democrats block this, and so we're not going to take it up again. I don't think that's a good enough answer. Um, I think what the state of New Hampshire did in terms of putting together the law enforcement commission that has made a number of recommendations just about law enforcement, obviously. But one of the things that impressed me the most as I talked to people who participated in that effort was that all of those recommendations were unanimous, that they worked on those and they talked through them until they were able to get agreement. And that's how we're gonna to begin to address some of the differences. And as long as we're not willing to talk to each other about them, as long as we're not willing to say, we're gonna sit in the room until we can work this out, um, we're not gonna make progress. And, and so we've got to keep at it. I'm hopeful that if in a new administration with a new Senate, that we will have another opportunity to begin to make some progress on these issues. Do you believe that there is a problem with systemic racism in law enforcement in, in this country? I think there is a problem with systemic racism generally in our society. Um, there are differences because we, I think for many, probably most of us, we don't think about those because we, uh, we are from communities, you know, unless we were in a situation where it was brought to our attention, we're not thinking about it. Um, but again, I think it's an, a dialogue, a national dialogue that we need to have. Sorry, I'm up again. Um, so you were in Keene this summer um, at visiting the, the solar project that the city of Keene uh, did on Marlboro Street. And so um, what are your priorities in terms of the environment and on clean energy? Well, the issue that I've worked the most on in trying to address clean energy in Washington has been energy efficiency. And it really goes back to even before my days in public office, my husband and I built our house in Madbury in 1979 in the middle of the Iranian oil crisis. And at that time, Jimmy Carter was president and there were tax credits to do a number of things to make your homes more energy efficient. And that's important because 40% of our energy use is in buildings. So we put um, solar panels on our roof to heat our hot water. Um, we put in triple pane windows. We put in, we built an envelope house, which is a house that has a heat sink on the south side and an airspace in the north wall and the air circulates around and acts as an insulator. And um, we put in a furnace that burned oil and wood and garbage if we had needed to. And we were able to get tax credits for all of those. And that's what started my interest in efficiency because if we can reduce the demand, then we don't have to um, produce the energy. And over the last 40 years, we have saved more energy in America through efficiency than we have produced in fossil fuels and nuclear power combined. So it is a low hanging fruit that we ought to be taking advantage of. And since 2010, 2011, um, when Rob Portman got elected, he and I have been working on legislation to try and expand um, energy efficiency in this country. And we have gotten it through one house or the other, almost, I guess, every congressional session since that time. Um, but in the last couple of sessions, it's been killed by the home builders who don't support what are voluntary building codes in this legislation that would have the effect of taking about 3.3 million cars off the road for the next um, 10 years. It would significantly reduce the cost to consumers of energy, and it would put hundreds of thousands of people to work. So there are huge 
opportunities that we have, not just through efficiency, but through um, clean energy technologies. And it's one way to help restart our economy as we think about the jobs that are there. Um, one of the reasons I was very excited when I first got elected to get put on the Energy Committee is because I thought we were going to really address this. I thought it was going to be like um, a major initiative of the last administration. And sadly, it got hung up on other issues that came before it. But it is as we think about how do we address climate change, dealing with our energy needs is probably the number one aspect of doing that. I'd like to shift the conversation to a new topic. Um, you know, in, in the last few years, there have been a lot of concerns about foreign entities interfering with um, our elections in various ways from, you know, uh, setting up fake events on Facebook to just inserting discourse, uh, discord into conversations. Um, in the short term and in the long term, what are some steps that can be taken to either prevent this from happening to begin with or to stop it from having the intended impact? Um, well, one of the first things I did after the 2016 election was to support legislation that required entities who were um, operating in the United States to have to register. Um, we had not been requiring them to do that under our um, laws. And so Russia was not required. They, they were not charged under our law because they weren't, they were able to get through on a loophole and do all of the um, sort of above the board manipulation of our election in 2016. Now they did a lot of, um, a lot of it behind the scenes as well. So that actually has gotten passed. Um, it was included in a broader piece of legislation. But the other thing that I think is probably most important is we've got to educate young people and Americans about the threat that is posed here. You know, as, as a member of the Foreign Relations and Armed Services Committees, I've heard a lot of people talk about the fact that what Russia is doing is not new. What China's doing is not new. You know, we've, we've had uh, foreign interference in our democracy really since, um, since the 40s. But what is new is social media that makes it so rampant and so difficult for people to discern what's real and what's not. And so one of the things we've got to do is really help educate people from the earliest days. Italy has a program that they've been doing in the schools to try and help um, kids learn to recognize what's real information and what is not. Um, that's one of the things I think we can think about. Germany did a better job after Russia interfered or tried to interfere in their elections because they made it all public. You know, one of the challenges we've got in the United States is we can't get we can't get our intelligence communities to release the information in a way that makes people understand what's going on. I continue to be frustrated by that um, because I think it's part of the reason people are not sure, you know, is this real, is this not real? And the more people know about what's going on, the better they can respond to it. Um, but I think it is a serious, um, has, the potential to really impact our democracy in ways that are very serious. And we need to be much more responsive in the general public about this. In 2017, I did um, one of the first speeches by senators up at Dartmouth um, talking about the impact of the um, effort to interfere in our election in 2016 and what that meant and what, what we needed to do to respond to it. So I think this is an ongoing challenge that we have and it, it is unfortunate that it's become so politicized um, by President Trump because even, even we saw the Senate um, Intelligence Committee chaired by Richard Burr come out with their report that said yes it happened it was real and it's very troubling to me to see 
that there are senators who have been trying to hold hearings that would undercut what that intelligence has very clearly shown. Um, I'm told that I've got about five minutes before I need to get off for my next uh, meeting. Well, well, we'll try to do that. Um, Senator, so one of the criticisms um, that we hear occasionally in this area is um, a, regarding the nation still being at war in Afghanistan, still having some presence in Iraq and, and the Middle East. Um, and so since you do sit on these committees that have everything to do with that, um, maybe you can um, talk a little bit about why we are still in Afghanistan and, and what the conditions need to be to get out. Um, well, I think we're still there because it was, um, it was a war that from the beginning was not, um, was not fought in the way that it probably should have. We, when we went into Afghanistan and the Taliban fell, instead of um, staying focused on that and instead of finishing that job, we went into Iraq and diverted attention and resources away from Afghanistan. I think the challenge now is how do we get out in a way that prevents Afghanistan from becoming another a haven for terrorist activity again. And from my perspective, some of the other issues that are critical as we think about how do we reach a peace agreement there that allows us to withdraw our troops is um, what happens to some of the freedoms that have been put in place by their constitution that was written by the Afghans, particularly for women and girls. Um, as I have traveled in Afghanistan and met with women in the country, one of the things they have really begged me to stay focused on is that whatever we do in the United States, that we ensure that, um, that protections remain for women in the country, that they continue to be allowed to go to school, that they continue to be allowed to have jobs, and as we know, the Taliban, at least in the years that they ruled in Afghanistan, were brutal to the women of the country. And I am not reassured in these peace negotiations that we have taken a tough enough stance with the Taliban. Let's shift quickly to U.S.-China relations, which uh, have been deteriorating. What do you think is the biggest threat that China poses now? And what do you think the U.S. should be doing about China's military moves in the Pacific? Um, I think China poses a threat both militarily and economically. Um, you know, just if we think about China's Belt and Road Initiative, where they are um, spending billions of dollars across Asia and even into Europe, we have not countered that in any major way over the last few years. I had a conversation with um, the former Prime, Prime Minister Cyprus of Greece about um, their port, um, Piraeus, that the Chinese um, basically took over. And I said, so why did Greece do that? You know, Greece has been an ally of the United States. Um, you are, what you're doing is gonna be seen throughout Europe. And he said, well, I asked the EU for help with the money we needed to um, expand that port and uh, restore it. They said, no, I asked the United States, you said no. And the Chinese said, here, take our money. And while I think countries are beginning to understand that the Chinese help comes with strings attached and in the long term, it may present more challenges that it's worth, we have not effectively countered those kinds of um, efforts. And it's one of the reasons that I have uh, signed on with a number of my colleagues in the Foreign Relations Committee to a bill, the, really the biggest um, bill that we've had in my time in the Senate 
to try and counter Chinese influence and to do it through a combination of diplomacy and trade and economic assistance. Um, so I, I think we've got to look at how we respond in a variety of ways. It's one of the reasons that I work with Marco Rubio and we tried to prevent um, taxpayer dollars through the thrift savings program that federal employees invest in from being invested in companies in China that are basically controlled by the Chinese government. Because I don't think it makes sense for us to make those investments in Chinese, China's economy when China is not um, playing by the same rules that we're playing by in the United States in terms of financial uh, transparency and requirements. So I think we have a lot of work to do with respect to China and that it needs to be comprehensive and it needs to be consistent and the Chinese need to know where we stand and have no doubt about that. And I think I probably have to go at this point, but I really appreciate the opportunity to see you all, even though it's only on the screen and not in person. And uh, I look forward to being back there in person at some point after the new year, hoping, assuming that I get reelected and uh, I have the honor of continuing to serve in this position. Well, we appreciate your time and, uh, and good luck in the election. Well, thank you. A lot of work to do.